Hello, my name is John Broadwell and I'm an Embedded Systems Engineer and Medical Device Development Consultant at my company Broadwell Consulting Inc. If you need help with one of those things, give me a call. So today we're going to be talking about the internals of the Serial Wombat 18AB firmware. Uh, we'll touch a little bit on the Serial Wombat 4B firmware and uh, we will take a look at how to build the code and the general structure of the layout of the code. This particular video is not targeted towards people who bought the chip pre-programmed and want to use it with Arduino or Raspberry Pi or C Sharp over a PC or whatever like that. This is targeted towards people who want to download the source code of the actual firmware that runs inside of the Serial Wombat 18AB chip and potentially uh, make changes to it, add pin modes of their own, things like that. So let's get started. This particular presentation that I'm about to show was one is an abbreviated version of one that I showed to some microchip field application engineers uh, shortly before I released the product. The Serial Wombat firmware architecture is, it, to a degree, very simple. It's one big while loop that runs inside of main, and each Serial Wombat pin has a dedicated RAM area that stores the data associated with that state machine. When we send commands down over the I2C or UART, it puts a pin into a particular state machine. It assigns a state machine to that pin. And you can assign all of the pins to a state machine. Like for instance, they can all each have their own individual servo driver or debounced input. Or you can mix and match state machines on different pins with a small number of restrictions. Generally, it's pretty flexible. So each pin gets serviced every one millisecond so that the state machine can do updates. And so you do some quick math on that. You know, 18 pins every one millisecond. Each pin only gets chunks of at most about 50 microseconds uh, of time. Now, in reality, they could take a little bit more than that if other pins take less. Uh, some state machines take more CPU time to run. For instance, the uh, the, the software-based UARTs or uh, hardware-based uh, rotary encoders, things along those lines tend to suck up a lot more power. Things where you have to you have to deal with streams of bits uh, take up more. Things that are pretty simple and do something once every one millisecond or less uh, tend to be pretty quick. So how do we decide when to run these? Well, the while loop uh, is in the foreground executive checks a global flag and that global flag is set by a one millisecond hardware timer. Let's take a look at the code for that. Here we are in MP Lab X. We'll talk a little bit more about the projects and how they're structured and things like that. But for right now, since we're just talking about the firmware, let's go into the Serial Wombat 18AB project and open main. That's where we are right now. And here's main. So we go in and we do some initialization, initialize some things, and we come into our while one loop, which is the, the heart of the, uh, the execution. And you can see we just stay in this while one loop forever. And if the run foreground loop, if the run foreground Boolean gets set, then it's time to run the foreground. So we come in here, we process all of our pins, and we set run foreground to false. And so then it'll stay false until another timer interrupt one millisecond later comes in and sets it true. So that's pretty much it. In a nutshell, that's how the Serial Wombat does what it does. There's a lot of details behind that. So the I squared C peripheral and UART processing are interrupt driven. And so an interrupt, a, a byte comes into the UART or gets clocked into the I squared C, an interrupt goes off and puts it into a queue, a data buffer. And when eight bytes are accumulated on the UART, or when uh, an I squared C packet is complete that has eight bytes in it, then the uh, main executive processes those bytes inside of the processor. So if we go back to main, we can see that within this while one loop, every time we go through the while one, we're doing process RX. And that is looking at those buffers that come out of the interrupts 
and determining, okay, did, did a new packet come in? And if so, what do I have to do to process it? So you can see that all of the time, essentially, that the Serial Wombat chip is not running the foreground uh, processing pins. It's essentially stuck in this very tight while one loop uh, being ready to immediately process, uh, receive, and transmit. Once we go into the, the process pins, this process can take quite a long time in embedded standards, up to say, you know, maybe 800 microseconds. And for that reason, it's necessary for the I squared C to implement clock stretching, that we may have a situation where a command comes in and while we're doing this, uh, and the I squared C packet can be completed in, you know, tens of microseconds or less. And the uh, we're stuck in an 800 microsecond pin processing routine. So we use I squared C clock stretching to tell the host, okay, wait on the read that comes after the packet write until I can get back to this process RX and generate a result, uh, generate a response. For the UART, it's not a big, as big a problem because UART is uh, asynchronous. Uh, we get sent eight bytes and the host, as long as it doesn't have some timeout set, will essentially wait for an eight byte response. So as we said before, each pin has a state machine. And the users can assign any state machine in any combination. There are some limitations. Analog uh, processes can only be on these green pins that have analog capability in the chip. Uh, pins that use enhanced digital capability, such as WS2812B driving, can only be on the enhanced digital pins that have a dot in them. But for the most part, most of what you want to do can run on any of the uh, any of the pins. So, you know, and as you, if you're this far into the Serial Wombat uh, project that you're watching this video, you're familiar. We can do a bunch of different different things all at the same time. So the difference between the Serial Wombat 4B firmware and the Serial Wombat 18AB firmware. So the 4B runs on an 8-bit enhanced mid-range micro, a microchip, uh, PIC 16, 15, 214. Uh, it's only got four I.O. pins. There's six on the chip. We use two of them for communication. So it only has to run four state machines, which is good because this 16F 15, 214 is much less capable than the 24FJ 256GA702 we use for the bigger chips. Uh, each state machine only has 16 bytes for machine storage. So that's not a lot, but we get a lot done with it. Uh, this particular micro is fairly terrible at indirect addressing. If you, if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. But long story short, it's not good at array dereferencing. And things like pointer to struct, which I use on the 18AB firmware, are really bad. So the Serial Wombat 4B... Uh, firmware for each state machine copies it to a fixed copies the contents of that state machine to a fixed address so that each of the pin handlers can use direct addressing rather than indirect addressing which greatly uh, speeds up the ability of the code to uh, to execute so on the serial wombat 4b timed outputs like pwm are done by allocating one timer resource per pin. There's a lot of nice peripherals in the uh, 16F15214 and only four pins that we want to drive. So we can almost drive one with each with each uh, with each pin. We use have we make heavy use of what's called the peripheral pin select, which is an internal mux that allows you to connect internal peripherals to various external pins. Uh, pulse timing is done with interrupt on change. Servo output is done using a timer interrupt, and the I squared C address is constant in firmware. That's why I sell sets of four chips together. You get one 0x6C, one 0x6D, one E, and one F. And all of that's fine if you have three or four output pins. It doesn't scale to the 18 pins on the Serial Wombat 18AB. So the reason I picked the pick. Uh, 24FJ256GA702 was for a large degree because it had these DMA channels. DMA is a way that you can write uh, data between peripherals and memory or vice versa without the CPU helping. 
And that'll become very important. We'll talk about that. Uh, there's continuous multi-sample ADC channel uh, sampling. So under normal circumstances, all of the pins are constantly being converted in a round robin. And because we typically only access them once every millisecond, uh, that's sufficient. We just go to the buffer and pull out the latest conversion, which will be very close to, you know, uh, instant, given the speed of the A to D converter versus how often we're using it. There's four capture compare uh, capture compare units, and uh, those are used for generating PWM or measuring pulses. Those only work with the dot pins. There's four output compare units. What's the difference between a CCP and an output compare? Okay, that's when you start getting into the hundreds of pages of data sheet. But these are also used to generate pulses or PWMs. There's two hardware UARTs, one of which we use for the uh, UART communication. The other one could be used for I2C mm -hmm. to UART bridge. There's a bunch of hardware timers, and we can use the peripheral pin select on the chip for any of the dotted pins. There's a charge time management unit, which essentially when used with an A to D converter is how we do the cap touch. Yeah, it's pretty good. And we've got 256K of flash and 16K of RAM, which is compared to the Serial Wombat 4B, just a remarkably ridiculous large amount. So that's exciting. A lot of what the Serial Wombat chip is used for is interfacing. And so there's a uh, a need in many cases to generate output pulses. And those might be pulse width modulation for driving a meter, I'm sorry, a motor or an LED, or it might be pulses for driving a servo or a high speed servo. So the PIC 24FJ 256GA702 has six timing resources that I can use that are good for generating PWM or pulses. Uh, capture compare two through four and output compare one through three. We can't use CCP1 uh, essentially because it uh, is tied to pins in a non-selectable way. It doesn't go through the peripheral pin select. The Serial Wombat 18AB firmware has a timing resource manager to manage these. Essentially, the first six pins that request uh, timer output functions get handed one of these resources and then they get tied to the pins through the the peripheral called the uh, peripheral pin select and so the first six are going to be really good in the case of servos it actually shares them because a servo typically needs to be updated every 20 milliseconds out of which at most two and a half milliseconds are actually going to be used for a pulse. So the servo will borrow one of these timing resources, generate the pulse, and hand it back, at which point a different pin that was also configured to be a servo uh, can check out that timing resource and then generate its pulse and check it back in. In that way, uh, we can have any of the pins that have the dot all work in parallel uh, creating uh, outputs for servos, all of which uh, can be timed with accuracy of about 100, with precision of about 125 nanoseconds. So it, it really is quite, quite a capable system. Uh, so we check out these timing resources and we check them back in. And here's some interfaces for those. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, we talked just now about the servo, how it can how it can check them out. A PWM is constantly in the state of generating uh, highs and lows, so a PWM will grab one of those timing resources and hold on to it indefinitely. So the question, one of the things the Serial Wombat chip can do is generate 18 simultaneous PWMs. How do we do that and also do other stuff like communications if there's only six timing resources available? And the answer is we use DMA. So we, there are four DMA channels. The, the pins on the Serial Wombat chip are allocated to port A and port B, each of which is potentially up to 16 uh, pins wide, but in reality is a little bit less than that because of what's actually pinned out on the 28-pin uh, the, the dip. And so we use four DMA channels to read LAT A and LAT B, that's port input, 
and to this read should say right and to write port a and port b and we do that 57,600 times per second. Those of you who are familiar with UART communications would say, oh, I recognize that. That's a baud rate. And that's specifically chosen for that reason. Uh, the way that this works is that each DMA has 128 entries in it. And every 17 microseconds, we move to the next entry. So you have... Uh, it takes approximately 60 of these uh, DMA cycles to make a millisecond. So we've got 128 entry loop. Each millisecond, we move about 60 entries. And so it's possible for the pin modes that have to do things faster than every one millisecond, such as, say, a 19,200 baud uh, uh, software UART, to queue up bytes I'm sorry, queue up bits that will be synchronously sent out over the port or look at uh, sampled times of the, uh, of the port that have happened since we last looked at it. So like for instance, the, uh, the quadrature encoder reader by default reads every one millisecond and it looks at both ports and it's saying, okay, did I get some pulses that came in one after another in either direction, which would indicate a knob turn. Uh, but if you're doing something really fast, like reading a fast spinning motor, once every millisecond might not be fast enough. And so in those cases, we turn on the DMA and we actually look at the stream of data coming in from the DMA that comes in at 57,600 entries per second. And so at that point, you know, you can, you can start, uh, effectively reading uh, rotary encoders that perhaps are spinning at 10,000 pulses per second or something like that. So, you know, it's uh, it's really effective. Uh, the downside is that it's processor intensive. And some of these things, if you load up uh, enough of them, will actually overflow the one millisecond executive where you're trying to stuff more than a millisecond worth of work into every millisecond and then the the whole system degrades badly there's a variety of tools that we'll talk about in a different video for checking on your uh throughput utilization to make sure that you haven't overflowed the uh the uh, chip most users aren't going to have to worry about that it's mostly going to be people who are using either things that transition really, really quickly, quickly being multiple times per millisecond, or people who are using the software-based UARTs. So we talked about how there were six hardware timers. The hardware timer has sub-microsecond sub resolution, uh, which gives you servo output that's approximately 14-bit. Uh, you know, so we've got uh, we've got the ability to, to differentiate between about 8,000 different positions. Uh, the, uh, the DMA runs at 67,000 Hertz, which is about every 17.36. And that gives you about seven bit resolution. So on a 180 degree servo, that would be about one and a half degrees for many things. That's good enough. You know, if you've got some kind of a latch that you're opening, you know, or, or things where you don't need super precise precision, uh, that'll be fine for things like if you were driving a robot arm or, you know, trying to precisely position uh, something where where you want as much resolution as possible, you'd want to use the, the timing pins and uh, the timing capable pins and allocate your most important precision required first so that you get the best accuracy. And the PWM, when you're running in DMA mode, trades off... Uh, frequency versus resolution. Again, it can it can transition every 17.36 microseconds. So if you try to drive a PWM using DMA at 38,000 hertz, it's either going to be on or off. Uh, if you try to do it at 1 kilohertz, you're going to get 5-bit or uh, 32 levels. If you do it at 100 hertz, you get 9-bit. So, you know, you don't want to use the uh, necessarily use the DMA based PWM for something like a motor drive, uh, where you're, you're going to want fairly high resolution, but for something like a visible led, 
uh, it it is it is very effective. So timed input. Right now, the timed input is also used on DMA, and so we can measure input pulses with a, an accuracy of uh, 17 microseconds. Uh, one of the future firmware improvements will be to share some of those six uh, capable uh, hardware things and plumb those into the timed input. I just haven't finished that yet. So the DMA can be used, as we said before, for quadrature rotary encoders, potentially up to about 10 kilohertz. The software UART runs off of these things. And so we can do a software UART transmit at 57,000, 288, 192, 9600, and so on and so forth. Basically, any integer multiplier, I'm sorry, integer divisor of that 57,600. For receive, typically to do good UART reception, you want to sample each uh, bit three times so that you can properly find the middle so that if you're off by 5% on your baud rate that you don't get, uh, get framing errors or incorrect things. So the receive rate can be 19,200, 9,600, 4,800, 24, 12, or 300. And again, there is one available hardware you are, that can go all the way up to 115,200. Uh, so, but, you know, 9,600 is very useful for a lot of things. It's a great way to add a terminal. And it's also the speed at which uh, many uh, GPS receivers run. So, you know, that, that can be very effective adding a UART software that you can access over I squared C if you don't have enough UARTs on your Raspberry Pi or Arduino or, you know, things like that. Up to seven pins can be used for analog to digital conversion. And that's based on the pins that have analog capability in the PIC 24FJ256 GA702. Uh, they're 12 bits and they're measured against VDD. In the future, it'll be possible to switch them all to a reference pin uh, so that you can measure against a different reference. Uh, mixing of those is probably gonna severely degrade the, uh, the performance of the A to D in terms of conversions per second because I have to go into a polling mode. I can't have it in the automated auto sampling mode and switch uh, reference for every pin. That's just a limitation of the, the microcontroller I'm running on. The A to D pin samples at, the pin mode samples at one kilohertz. The actual pin is sampling much faster than that. Uh, and the pin mode is capable of then averaging uh, multiple one millisecond samples together. It keeps track of the min, the max, all that stuff. You guys are familiar with that. The CTMU is the charge time management unit, unit, and it's used for cap touch, temperature, and resistance measurement. Essentially, there's a 55 uh, microamp source in there that we can drive out either to charge up a capacitive plate, like a touch sensor, or to drive through a resistor to get a, uh, to get a, a resistance measurement. So it also goes through the internal temperature diode. So when you turn these functions on, uh, they have to take exclusive control for a little while, a little while being a few micro, a few milliseconds of the A to D converter. And so it will reduce the sample rate of the other pins. Again, that's probably not going to matter for a lot of my users, but for people who are using the internal uh, PID control or hysteresis control or things where you want fast response on a regularly sampled things, that could be an impact. But again, 90% of the people aren't going to worry about that. So communications happens through a hardware peripheral uh, at up to 115,200. The I squared C address is selected by leaving the address pin open or to ground. It uses that same charge time management unit that happens both in the bootloader and in the application. Uh, the communication mode is determined at reset. And the UART can be enabled in parallel with the I squared C because of the way that we do our, com our communications processing. We'll look at that some more in depth in a, in a little bit because uh, essentially we have different interrupt routines uh, processing to different buffers from I squared C and UART. 
So a future video will show how you can control a Serial Wombat chip with Arduino over I2C, yet still plug into it at the same time with the Wombat panel or other application from a PC so that you can manipulate and view what's going on in the chip in real time. Serial Wombat communications are made up of an 8-bit, 8 8-byte 8 packet of a proprietary protocol. Uh, an 8-byte comes from the Arduino and causes an 8-byte response from the Serial Wombat chip. And I'll say Arduino, but it could be Raspberry Pi, it could be the PC, whatever. I2C utilizes clock stretching. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And the UART relies on proper packet syncing. There's no packetization to the UART. Uh, a resync, so the question is what happens if we send half a packet or one side misses one of the eight bytes and then, oh no, everything will be out of whack from there forward. The way that the packets work is the first byte of the response always matches the first byte of what's sent. And so the, uh, the you know, you can get a pretty good idea that things are out of whack if you send a command and you don't get a response over UART or if they come back with the bytes in the wrong positions at which point you can send out 0x55, that's a capital U, that value is picked because it alternates bits on every, uh, on every bit. And at that point it will throw, if it receives a 0x55 as the first byte of a packet, it'll throw it away as if it was never received. So if you send out eight of those, you can be guaranteed that now the Serial Wombat chip is ready to receive the beginning of a packet. So that's how we resync. Uh, most commands are in binary, but a subset of them are in ASCII, so you can actually type to it, and you would have seen this in the Getting Started video. So the Serial Wombat firmware is built heavily around a series of arrays and structures in memory. Uh, each pin has memory allocated for its state machine, and this is transparent to the user. There's a fixed amount of memory allocated to every pin. Uh, not every pin state machine type uses all of the RAM that's available to it. If it doesn't, then it just sits idle. Uh, that RAM can be peaked and poked by the communication interface, but there's not a lot of reason typically that a, an ordinary user would want to use it to do that. It's mostly so that I can play games with it or observe things when I'm trying to debug when I'm creating a new, a new pin mode. Each pin has one piece of 16-bit public data. This is the single most relevant piece of data for that pin state machine. So for a servo, it would be the position. For an A to D converter, it would be the A to D value. For PWM, it's duty cycle. Uh, for IO, it's the pin value. And it, that becomes important because like if you look at the if you look at the API to talk to the chip, in many cases, there's not uh, when you get down a couple of levels, all we're doing is reading or writing to that piece of, of public data. So for the servo, uh, you say, oh, okay, to move the servo, you say write public data for pin 14. For the uh, PWM to change the data si duty cycle, you also say, oh, write, write public data for pin number 14. And so there's a unified interface around that. You know, for the uh, for the the A to D converter, you would read back uh, the public data, and it would give you a value from zero to sixty five five thirty five, depending on what the relative position of the voltage is compared to zero and your reference voltage. Some things, such as the WS twenty eight twelve driver, or the software UARTs require the ability to have some more RAM to run. They, they have more needs than what could effectively be allocated to them if we were gonna make each state machine big enough times 20 different pins. So for that, there's 8K of on-chip RAM that's called the user buffer. And this buffer can be allocated by the user. So when you start up the WS2812B, and you can see a, a, a demo of this, uh, you might say, oh, okay, WS2812B, uh, use, you can use a chunk of the user buffer starting at address 600. And then it's up to the user to allocate that stuff effectively uh, so that the various pin modes don't step on each other. That's something that will be a goal of mine to make uh, more foolproof and easy to use in the future. But for right now, it, uh, it, 
it is what it is and it works it works pretty well so that 8k of on chip user buffer is separate from the buffer that each pin has to hold its state machine data the piece of 16-bit data that we talked about a public data format where possible one of the fundamental ideas of the serial wombat chip is that we scale everything from zero to 65 535 zero being the minimum possibility value 65 535 being the maximum possible so for a servo zero would move it all the way to one side 65 535 would move it all the way to the other and essentially what that would do would be scale the pulse times to minimum or maximum for pwm zero is off ffff is on and anything in between uh, is varied and it doesn't matter what the resolution of the final output is if you know if it's one of the dma based pins that doesn't have a lot of resolution uh, you're going to have a lot of values that give the same output, but they'll still span that 65535. If it's one of the high resolution outputs, then you're going to have a lot more individual steps within that 65535. But conceptually, whether it's a high resolution input or output or a low resolution input or output, you can still... Uh, scale all of them from zero to 65 535 and you can really see that because like on the serial wombat 4b it has a 10-bit a to d converter but those 10 bits then are each multiplied by 64 so that you get an output from zero to 64 65 5 something something and then there's a, hard, a software step that is, if it's the maximum reportable value, it bumps it up to 65,535. Similarly, the Serial Wombat 18AB, it has a 12-bit A to D, but since there's two extra bits, instead of moving in 64 count increments, it moves in 16 count increments. But it's, again, its range is from 0 to 65,535. So that concept is very important and fundamental to the way that the Serial Wombat chip is architected for use. Public data is, are these buffers? Each pin has a 16-bit buffer, or there's a whole bunch of system variables, and each of those are 16-bit variables. So, like, for instance, you can get the public data, say, you know, you can get public data from pin number four, which might be configured as an A to D converter. But you can also get public data from index 65, which is just a number that increments every time it's accessed. That's great for debugging. Uh, some of these uh, 1,024 millivolt counts are for my use. Uh, some of them, the number of frames that have run since reset. Uh, some of them are the source temperature in hundredths of a degree. Uh, the number of data packet errors that have been detected. The number of packets that have been received. There's all this interesting uh, public data that's available. And if you go back and you look, say, at the TM1637 uh, video, it'll show how you can actually have one pin that's controlling a TM1637 display display the output from another pin without any interaction from the host. So that's very that's very exciting. And there's also a pulse on change pin. So for instance, if you wanted to create a communications LED, uh, you could have the pulse on change pin generate a 50, micro, uh, 50 millisecond high pulse anytime public data number 71 changed so that you would get an LED that blinked all the time that the Serial Wombat chip was getting uh, getting data coming in. So it's very, very flexible and it has great potential. This is one of the places where the Serial Wombat 18AB really excels compared to the Serial Wombat 4B. Uh, it, it's really capable of offloading a lot of things that you might do on the Arduino or Raspberry Pi into the chip for things that are routine. Uh, another example of the pulse on change is if you had a matrix keypad, you might want to give the user some feedback, a beep, every time they push it. The You could set the interrupt on change pin mode to monitor the output, the public data of the matrix keypad and have it pulse a buzzer every time that output changes so that the, the Arduino 
doesn't have to responsively create those pulse sounds. So it's very, it's very powerful. And this actually is everything I just said. So I'll give you about 10 seconds to read through this, then we'll move on. So, and actually, it's, this says future, because I was talking to the microchip fellows back in December. The future is now. Uh, there, were, there was also output scaling and control so that we can, uh, so that we can uh, modify those values as they go out to the pins. And this is a big topic. There'll be a whole nother video on that. So we have a bootloader. It's a simple bootloader that allows upgrading of firmware over either I squared C or UART. Uh, you can do it, when, when this was out, it was from an Arduino sketch, but now the uh, Wombat panel uh, also supports direct downloading of a hex file. And I've tested, but not done a video on a command line interface that runs effectively on the PC or on a Raspberry Pi that can also download a hex file. So now let's take a look at the structure of the uh, GitHub repository. If you go to GitHub slash Broadwell Consulting Inc. slash Serial Wombat, you'll end up here. Uh, from here, you can either download a zip or you can clone uh, using Git. Uh, and so I've noticed I've got four forks and eight stars. That's exciting to think that uh, some people's actually getting down here and looking at that. There's a, a, a quick overview of the firmware that basically is a text version of the PowerPoint presentation we just went through. So you'll see here that there are five directories uh, of which we care about three. The post-processing utility, don't worry about that. That's how I generate Arduino uh, arrays that can be downloaded over I squared C. It's essentially to prepare the final application for bootloading. Uh, people who are just interested in playing with the firmware, downloading it using a PIC kit 3 or PIC kit 4 uh, through MP Lab, don't need to worry about that. The Serial Wombat Common directory contains a variety of uh, header files. Like, for instance, the pin modes, each pin mode has a number that goes associated with it. That's shared among the Serial Wombat 4B firmware and the Serial Wombat 18AB firmware, because you know you really want those things to be consistent. Uh, the Serial Wombat error list, uh, some commands return an error, and so that's consistent, although the Serial Wombat 4B mostly just returns a generic error. There was enough flash space to do a lot of it specifically. Uh, so. Those are header files, and those will get pulled in by both of these projects. The Serial Wombat 4, 4A and 4B, uh, there's a project here. We're not going to talk about that in depth. The 18AB, uh, you'll see that there's three MP Lab projects in here. The Serial Wombat 18A, 18B, that's your application. That's what actually runs the pin modes. That's where you're going to spend 99.9% .9 of your executive time. And... Uh, that's what the Arduino library and Raspberry Pi, Python, and C Sharp and all that typically talk to to get your projects done. The bootloader is, as you would expect, uh, a project that runs at startup and then either stays in the bootloader or jumps to the application. Uh, if we stay in the bootloader, then we can download fresh code. Jump to app is a replacement for the bootloader uh, because when you load the bootloader, it loads the application, but the problem with that is there's a lot of common code between the two of them. And so there are conflicting namespace, not namespaces, but uh, there's there's variables, you know, say like Rx buffer that are defined in both the bootloader and the Serial Wombat application code. And that's fine because jumping to app is essentially like doing a reset. We reset the stack. We, uh, you know, initialize all of our variables. So it's not like those, it's not like they're taking up space in two places, but the debugger gets confused and doesn't always reference the one you want. Typically, you're only going to be debugging the application. And sometimes you'll get memory spaces for the bootloader, which you don't want. So anyway, the solution to that is to replace the bootloader with just jump to app which is a very simple, stupid main that just looks at the reset vector in the alternate vector table 
for the application and jump straight to that address instead of doing any bootloading activity. The download side to that, of course, is you can't bootload with it. So let's take a look in MPLAB X. And I've got it loaded here. I've got two projects loaded, the Jump to App and the Serial Wombat 18AB. And these, this is where all of the code that we're interested in is going to be. And so the important things to know, first of all, are main. Uh, it will come in, and we looked at that earlier. It calls the process rx and it ca calls process pins every one millisecond. Anytime that it's not processing pins, it's trying to process received data if there's eight bytes that it's received to process. Process pins comes in here and you can see it's iterating through all of the pins. So, you know, it goes through 20 pins every one millisecond. So you get at most an average of 50 microseconds per pin. Now you can have a pin that, you know, like a software UART that, that eats up 120 microseconds every time you call it, but you can't have 10 of those or you'd end up with 1.2 milliseconds. And again, then, you know, you start getting behind in the DMA, timers stop working right, all kinds of bad stuff happens. And again, we'll have a video later that talks about how to monitor your real-time uh, CPU usage. And in here, you'll just see it's a big state machine. Every kind of pin, when we go in there, we set this global variable that says current pin register to the address of the beginning of the state machine memory for that pin. So if this is, you know, if, if we're processing pin number four, current pin is four, then the address of that will be the fifth entry, you know, because we index from zero, of the pin update registers. It'll be the address of that. That goes into this pointer, current pin register. And then we switch based on the current pin registers, pin mode. And it could be a digital I.O. It could be an analog input. Uh, it could be a quadrature encoder. It could be a matrix keypad. So any one of these, these, for each of the pins, we jump to the appropriate one millisecond handler for that pin mode. So let's just jump and take a look at update matrix keypad. So in here, we take that current pin register, which is a pointer to the area, to the state machine memory for that pin, say pin number four state machine. And we recast it as a pointer to a state machine specific structure. And we'll go to each pin has at the top of at the top of each pin mode file you'll find a state mode specific so in this case we've got a bunch of different data that is everything that we need to run the state machine for the uh for the uh matrix keypad and essentially we're we're by using a pointer it's almost like a way to create a union except they're not connected uh, so we're going to recast it and so the current reading of the keypad, the last reading, uh, what what data we're queuing or not, the what pins the four columns are on, what pins the four rows are on, uh, what are we currently pulsing which row to read what columns, uh, are we, uh, is there pin timing, is there is there are we queuing? If so, where are we queuing it? Uh, the buffer mode, are we outputting a binary? Are we outputting a number that corresponds to a telephone keypad? Are we outputting an index? All of these things, you can go in and watch the matrix keypad video and then see behind the scenes, this is the data inside of the Serial Wombat firmware that has to exist in order for that to happen. And again, we're taking and we're overlaying this structure on top of the bytes that are allocated for the uh, for the you know pin number four, pin number five, pin number six state machines. So we come down here, and the essential thing, you know, you'll see lots of state machines, and typically we come in here, and a very small part that's the init. We'll talk about that in a minute. A very small part of the update runs on any given time, because we only get five. We only get fifty microseconds on average out of every one millisecond. So you know. 
we we uh, have to get in, check on whatever it is we're supposed to check on, and then get the heck out so that the next pin can get a hold of the micro so that we can cycle all through all 20 pins before we hit that one millisecond timer and have to go on to the next pin. So lots and lots of state machines uh, that run that way. And you can see on any given entry, because of the way that the, the thing is set up, there's not going to be a lot of code run. So that's how we that's how we do the one millisecond updates. The other thing that's important is how we send data to and from from a state machine from the host. And so we said before that when we're not processing pins, we're processing received data. And we're going to gloss over right now how that data gets into the queues. Probably you guys won't mess with that. So we will go to the place where we process the data. And so if the UART is enabled, we look and we say, OK, are there eight or more bytes available to process in the UART? And if so, read them out and put them into a uh, buffer. And that's the Rx buffer. Rx buffer is the buffer that we process in the pin mode code, regardless of what interface it came up came into. Process Rx will worry about what interface the data came in on and worry about what interface to send the response on. Because we actually can run the UART and the I squared C in parallel, which is absolutely awesome if you want to run the code from an Arduino and be able to debug it and see what's going on inside the chip from a uh, from a, a PC. This is a massive, massive advantage compared to, say, just using a, a standard I squared C part that doesn't have a debugging interface on the back end. So anyway, so we get that. We read all the data into Rx buffer. Now there are eight bytes, exactly eight bytes in Rx buffer, and we go to process Rx buffer. This is process Rx, which is which is the high level that services the interfaces. Once we've put all the data into process into Rx buffer, then we go to process Rx buffer. And the first thing. There's Rx buffer, which is the data that goes into the host. Then there's Tx buffer, which when we leave this function, that's the data that will get sent back to the host. Uh, so the first thing we do is just assume it's going to be an echo. By default, any byte that comes in, we put the same byte in the response. And that could be useful for the host so that for unused bytes, you can at least say, hey, did they, ma did they match up? You know, that can help with synchronization and other stuff. So a very simple command, we look at Rx buffer zero. In that eight byte packet, the first byte says, what kind of packet is this? And so it could be an echo command. These, all of these are defined in that serial wombat common directory. So we look here and we say, oh, echo, this is one of the ASCII commands. It starts with a, with a, a 33, and it's, which is a, a, an exclamation point. You know, the reset command starts with a capital R. When we get down into the binary commands, they start with binary values that are outside of the ASCII range. So we do a switch on that first byte of the eight bytes that we received to determine, OK, what kind of packet is this, and how do we process it? So for instance, we mentioned before that each pin has a 16-byte, uh, I'm sorry, a 16-bit piece of public data. And so we can say uh, command binary read pin buffer. And so what it'll do is it will look. And the format of that command is uh, the first byte is 128, which says go read a buffer. The second byte is what buffer do we want to read? And that could be one of the pins, or it could be one of the pieces of public data, like number of packets received that we talked about earlier. So it will take that, it reads it into temp, and then this TX buffer 16 is shorthand for take this 16-bit value and starting at byte number two, load it into the transmit packet. So then we hit our break saying, OK, we completed that incoming command, which knocks us down all the way to the end of this big switch statement that lists out all the various possible commands. Scrolling, 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 scrolling. A lot of commands. Some of this stuff probably should be abstracted out into other functions. And you can see a lot of these commands are 
documented in line using Markdown so that they pop out in the Doxygen documentation, which is available through GitHub IO for the Serial Wombat chip. The protocol is pretty well documented that way. So we pop out here and uh, we finish our break statement. And then at that point, oh, here, let me go up a little bit. We finish our break statement and we go back. So at this point, TX buffer is loaded with whatever we we've, we've processed, whatever eight bytes came in, and TX buffer is loaded with any response if if there is one. So after we get out of process uh, RX buffer, then we send the response back out. And how that goes out depends on whether the packet came in over I squared C or U R. So that's about the size of it. So you'll notice that there's a whole bunch of uh, case statements in that process RX that all point to process set pin. And that's how we process an incoming packet that will configure a pin. So let's jump down to that one. You can see that there can be as many as more, as more than 20 pot different ways that you can process a pin. And they're all formatted the same way. So we come in here and the pin that we're going to configure uh, is in RX buffer one. And the pin mode that we're going to configure it to is in RX buffer two. So we've used one byte, the zero byte for what configuration command, byte one for the pin number, byte two for the mode number. Bytes three, four, five, six, and seven, then our variable data that can be used to configure the pin. And so again, we'll do a switch on whatever pin mode we're trying to configure a pin to. So again, let's take a look at the matrix keypad. Suppose that we sent it a uh, command 200, which means configure pin, uh, six, we're gonna use pin six to be the main pad for the matrix keypad, and then 15. So we sent it 200, six, 15 as the first three bytes. That would tell it configure matrix keypad because keypad's byte keypad is is mode number 15. So then it would vector into this particular code, not vector, but it would it would call into this particular code. And we get here. And by default, any pin has most pins modes have this guard in there that the channel mode zero is the only command you can give if you're not already in that pin mode. And that helps protect things from getting out of whack. Uh, there's a variety of places where we do uh, sanity checking on what comes in from the uh, from the, the host. And if it fails, it'll call error and then just return. And what error does is it returns a special packet that instead of returning the the command in the first byte, remember most, most bytes echo out unless there's a good reason not to, it returns a capital E and then it returns an error code. And if you run this on the Arduino, there's actually an optional error handler that you can enable that will, uh, that will interpret those communication errors, which can be just absolutely invaluable uh, when you're trying to debug. So, but assume we get through all that. And we come in here again. We said we sent a 206 15 as the first three bytes, and that would get us into configure channel mode zero for the matrix keypad. And again, up here, the current pin register gets set before we come in here. This is a pointer, just like before, to the state machine memory for this particular pin. And we cast it again into the matrix keypad structure. So we create this, this matrix keypad pointer to a matrix keypad structure that actually is pointing to our state machine data. Then we come down here and we can start configuring each thing. And so you can see that, oh, what do we send as the configure zero command for matrix keypad? Well, some of the most important information, what, are, what pins are you connected up to? Row zero, row one, row two, and row three, and column zero, 
what pins are they attached to? And so that's what will come through. It's going to take multiple uh, commands to configure this thing, though, because it takes up to eight bytes to configure a, uh, a matrix keypad. So then we'll look and we'll have a second command. Uh, configure mode five. And there's a reason why it jumped up to five. Uh, because there's kind of a convention that I've got that you don't need to worry about of how I handle queuing. But in this case, to configure a matrix keypad, you can send command zero, then you send configure mode five, and the column pins one, two, and three uh, get set by RX buffer three, four, and five. Then we set up the buffer mode, which says the public data, does it dis does the data hold, the 16-bit the public data, does it hold a, a bitmap of all 16 keys? Or does it hold uh, an index 0 to 15? Or does it rep hold a rep an ASCII representation of the most common uh, phone style plus ABCD keypad that you see? Excuse me. And uh, so, and then queue mode, what are we going to queue up? Are we queuing up uh, changes in the bitmap again? Or are we queuing up ASCII values? Or what are we doing here? And then there's a variety of other uh, configuration slash access commands you can get that like for instance okay i want to look at the matrix keypad give me the last key that was was uh that was accessed and let's take a look just real quick at the arduino library code here we can see deep down into the guts of the serial ma serial wombat matrix keypad class for Arduino, and we can see see the begins. What do we do? Well, you can see we're just sending those two commands that we talked about before. We're creating a TX. We're, we're creating some byte arrays that are eight bytes long, and we're filling them in with those parameters that the firmware expects to see for those particular messages. So the begin is very simple. It just it sends that command zero and it sends that command five with the parameters we just looked at. Other stuff like oh we're going to read it. Uh, do that. We're going to, you know, peek it. There's all of these queue based uh, uh, commands that are available. So, you know, that's that's it. You can kind of see now from the Arduino interface how it gets put into an array that then gets sent to the Serial Wombat chip, how the Serial Wombat chip receives that data into a buffer. The buffer then gets fed to the, R, the process RX buffer function. The process RX buffer function then loads the pointer for the proper pin state machine memory address. Then, based on the pin mode that we're sending the commands for, picks the proper init function. The proper init function jumps to the proper handler. Then that handler looks at the first byte in the command protocol to figure is this command 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, you know, up to 20, and then parses it out properly, generates a response, and sends it back. So that's the big the big round trip from your Arduino or, or Python API all the way down through the libraries, through the communication interface, through the communication handlers, and then back up the other side. And it's you know, it's been years in the making and I'm pretty happy with it. It's been very flexible and very reliable. That is about all that I think we need to know about how the code works. There's a lot more details that I can go into in the future. Uh, so for right now, let's just say we're going to build this jump to app. And I've got a, a pick kit four connected. I could hit go. I could get program. Right now, we'll just do a clean and build. You'll note that over here, I have the jump to app set as the main, uh, the main uh, uh, project. You can say unset as main project or set as main project. And this project, if we go into properties. Uh, if we go to loading, you'll see then it loads the Serial Wombat 18AB application project as a loadable project. So then the net result of that is that it combines the two. So if we wanted to build something that wasn't for debugging, if we wanted to build something that was for distribution, we would close the jump to app 
and say open project and open the, the true bootloader. We would set that as main project and say build. I'm sorry, the pit gets not plugged in right now. Uh, we would say build and now it's going to build it. It'll build the bootloader, it'll build the application, and it'll smash the binaries of those two together with everything at the proper addresses. And then boom, you you download it, it starts up, the reset vector goes into the bootloader, the bootloader goes and it looks at some flash addresses and say, hey, is there a programmed application here? Hey, yes, there is. Okay, I'm going to jump to the reset vector from the alternate vector table, which is what's used by the application. If you're into, uh, you know, really deep interrupt stuff on the microchip pick uh, 24F series, and then boom, we go off to the application. But the important thing to know is that if you only load Serial Wombat 18A, 18B without either the bootloader or the jump to app, you're going to have problems because there's essentially not going to be an address programmed at the uh, at the, the reset vector. That at reset, we go into the bootloader or the jump to app. So I hope this is an information overload for everybody. Uh, you know, really, I could I could spend all day and, you know, microchip, if you want me to do a master's class on this, let me know. Uh, we'll go through the whole, the whole firmware and how I used your peripheral pin select and, you know, uh, all of the various hardware resources and all that kind of stuff to build something that's so incredibly flexible and general purpose is the Serial Wombat firmware. But uh, if you have questions, uh, leave them in the comments below. Uh, you, I should note that we build using uh, MPLABX IDE 545 is what I'm using, and I'm using XC16 version uh, 1.70. And typically, those are free versions. Uh, if you go into XC16, you can set the optimization Optimization level up to two is free. S and three, you have to pay money for, uh, but two works quite quite well. And you know we end up even with a with a, a lot of load with enough CPU cycles to spare, and so no reason to pay for the professional compiler on that. We I do use the professional compiler on the uh, the four B project, which you have to pay a monthly fee for, uh, because trying to shove all the the functionality into that little itty bitty uh, eight pin 16 F chip, I was able to get a lot more done and create a much better firmware with the commercial compilization. Downside is that, you know, it's not as maker friendly. So anyway, uh, that's about it for now. Uh, if you like this video, certainly hit like, uh, subscribe to the channel. Although if you're this deep into the serial wombat code and you're still watching me, you know, 40 some minutes in, you probably already have. Uh, leave me a comment if you have any questions. If you're, you know, if you're modifying the the Serial Wombat firmware, please let me know. I'm really interested to see. Oh, what you know, what is it that people are doing? If you create your own pin modes, please number them. Uh, pin mode F0, F1, F2, because I'm going to keep adding other pin modes, and the Canon pin modes will, you know, will increase in numbers. If you ever distribute your own firmware and you say, hey, I've got a really good idea for a pin mode, uh, work with me and give me a pull request, and I'll make sure that it fits within the, uh, the philosophy of the rest of the Serial Wombat code and doesn't break anything that you know, you might not be familiar with as a, as a user. And then we'll assign it an official pin mode and it'll become part of the official firmware. So, you know, just, uh, just let me know on stuff like that. I'm really excited that I'm getting questions about how do I do this with the firmware? How do I load it? How do I build it? You know, and hopefully this tutorial will help people who are interested in really getting into the nitty gritty of the thing, uh, understand how to modify it. So until we talk again, have fun, keep making stuff. The Serial Wombat firmware is available on GitHub and is constantly being updated. Subscribe below so that you can see the latest features and videos that come out as we fix bugs and add new features. The Serial Wombat open source project was created by Broadwell Consulting Incorporated. Broadwell Consulting Incorporated provides help developing medical devices with a focus on developing embedded firmware which is compliant with IEC 62304, ISO 14971, and ISO 13485, as well as remediation assistance for products already in production. For more information, contact John at Broadwell Consulting. Support requests for Serial Wombat 
should be sent to help at serialwombat.com and will be answered on an as-available basis. Also, feel free to leave your question in the comments below.